Hello Watch Enthusiasts and welcome to Watch Chronicler. The James Bond franchise has changed the way we enjoy films, from the exotic locations presented to the British public in the 1960s to an adventure format which has been adapted for every era until today. Even set design was changed by these movies, courtesy of the work of visionary designers such as Ken Adam in the early Bond adventures. Even so, it's in the field of men's clothing and accessories such as watches where the impact has been seen of late. This can be seen in the rising prices of 1960s Rolex Submariner 6538s, or the array of Omega Seamasters available for the 007 franchise. Over the last few months, we've seen not one, not two, not even three, but four different executions of the Omega Seamaster in honour of Bond, of which only one can obviously be actually worn by Daniel Craig in the upcoming No Time to Die. The most recent is a platinum gold version of the Seamaster with a 40 plus thousand pound price and ceramic and platinum bezel. Hardly a watch for everyone, yet this needn't be the case. So, in today's video, a few days after the anniversary of the end of filming of Goldfinger and the death of Ian Fleming, I'd like to tell you about a few Bond watches which you can afford and which might be more akin to the James Bond scene than the aforementioned Omega anyway. Now the first watch in this video wasn't actually worn by Roger Moore in For Your Eyes Only, but instead this is the successor of one which was. You see, he wore a Seiko tuna during the diving scene in which Bond and Melina Havelock fight an armoured diving suit in a sunken wreckage. This 600m diver was designed by Seiko to compete with the Rolex Sea Dweller and Omega Ploprof watches in the field of extreme diving, with the quartz version arriving in 1978. Today Seiko does make a modern equivalent, but I think the more affordable option is the one which really captures the style of that 1980s movie. This is the Seiko Solar Tuna, a modern interpretation of that iconic, near-circular dive watch, and unlike the unbelievably difficult to service original, has a modern solar quartz movement. Where specifications are concerned, this watch is a fair bit lighter than the original, given that it's now water resistant to only 200 meters, isn't a saturation diver, and has a screwed case back. However, with these reductions, the whole product has become more manageable, thanks to a smaller diameter of 46.7 millimeters, which results in a wear more akin to a 41mm watch of standard shape and a thickness of only 12.4 mils. You also get a very competent dive watch with superb luminous indices and the convenience of a solar movement. There are downsides such as the hard lex crystal and plastic shroud which screws on, something which by the way can be affordably replaced with a steel equivalent, but for under £300 it's a fantastic package and even captures the black and gold colours of the original. The next watch to consider is a piece not often associated with 007, but which nonetheless featured in The Living Daylights in 1987, the Tag Heuer 1000 dive watch. This 200 meter dive watch was worn by Timothy Dalton during filming, and for me might just be the last truly impromptu 007 watch appearance. For the following film, License to Kill, Dalton returned with the classic choice with the Rolex Submariner, and after that Pierce Brosnan was directly supplied by Omega. Now to this day, it remains unclear which version Dalton actually wore during the film, but what we do know is that it was a black PVD model with a fully luminous dial. Of course, the benefit of not knowing which model it was is that any can now be enjoyed as part of that cinema moment. Another benefit of the slightly obscure history here is that prices remain relatively low, and whilst Takoya makes servicing these watches difficult, there are drop-in replacement movements from ETA if the quartz movement in yours turns out to be a dud. For a decently maintained example, you should pay well under £1,000 today, and if you don't mind one which isn't quite the 007 reference with, say, a non-PVD case, you can pay around £600 for it. There are downsides here too, with a design derivative of the Rolex Submariner, a fairly flimsy bracelet, and of course a quartz movement, but you are still getting an awful lot of watch, and something not yet appreciated by the collector's market. An aspect to note though is that old PVD coatings really can't take the punishment of daily life without chipping. This gives a patinaed look which I personally think looks phenomenal. If you're enjoying this video, remember to like, share and subscribe, and head over to our Instagram page to always catch the latest updates about our videos, podcasts and articles. If you like what you see here, take a look at our website, watchchronicler.com, to read full articles and to catch the very best of our productions. For many, the digital watches used in the Bond franchise seem rather dated and not desperately appealing, but there was one other digital watch which I think deserves to be featured here, the Hamilton Pulsar P2. You see, the P2 was produced by Hamilton as the first successful digital watch with an LED display. In price, the gold version outdid contemporary Rolex watches, and even the later steel version was widely sold out. A well-known story, as recounted by Don Sowers, 
is how the Tiffany's customer who bought the last example before Christmas 1972 was given two offers before even leaving the shop. This watch also featured in the 007 franchise, and in fact welcomed Roger Moore into the role, as the watch he wore in the opening sequence of Live and Let Die in 1973, before being given his Rolex Submariner by M. While similarly priced to the Rolex, the Hamilton was a flawed product. Its battery life was low, and it lacked any features beyond the time. In 2020, however, Hamilton have rectified some of these problems. Available for £675 in brushed stainless steel, what's now called the Hamilton PSR is a near-perfect reproduction of the original with a 40.8mm by 34.7mm size. With a stunningly cut anti-reflective sapphire crystal and a screwed bracelet, it's also clearly a quality item for the money. What's certainly clear is that Hamilton have tried to make this watch usable in a way which, truth be told, the original wasn't. It's now water resistant to 100 meters and uses an LCD display to be legible during the day and a very efficient OLED display to give the same red readout as the original at night. Of course, this is a watch for a very particular kind of aficionado, but it's undeniably an interesting one. Moving up market from the PSR, a watch which deserves a place on this list is the Omega Seamaster 300M, a watch which not only revived Omega from a real slump in the early 90s, but also defined the 007 image. Crucially, it didn't just do this, because by featuring the plongeur hands of its predecessor and a helium release valve, it rekindled the diving heritage of Omega. With its slender case, 300 meter water resistance, iconic dial arrangement and scalloped bezel, it might just be the perfect modern alternative to what the Rolex Submariner was in the mid-20th century. I say this because amongst pilots, engineers and other officers in the RAF and Royal Navy, I found there's always at least one in the room. However, in the last couple of years, and much to my delight as an owner of the last original style model from 2016, the prices have been creeping up. Even so, without going for a quartz model as worn in Goldeneye, but sticking to an automatic example with the 1120 calibre, a modified ETA 2892, you can get hold of a pre-ceramic model for between £1,500 and £2,000. Inevitably, the condition does vary, from truly battered examples often topped off with a healthy serving of overpolishing, to mint versions for a bit more money. With that being said, there are so many examples on the market at the moment that I'm certain a good deal can be found for this veritable icon of both Bond and the diving world. One piece of advice, mind you, which I would give, is that should you like the versions with a stainless steel bezel rather than aluminium, buy one of them, since they were less popular at the time, are usually much better preserved, and can be found for less than the well-known blue variant. As far as Bond movies go, Thunderball might be the most iconic. The premise was pretty basic, a simple story of nuclear extortion, but was executed with such eye-opening shots in widescreen format and some of the most extensive underwater filming in the franchise. Oh, and you have to enjoy a film with a pool full of sharks. Importantly for this video, Bond is given a uniquely cased Breitling top time by Q, which is presented as a Geiger counter to locate the stolen warheads. Of course, this is hardly a standard watch courtesy of that tunnel case and different hands, but it did show a different direction for someone wanting a 007 watch. In the 1960s, the top time inhabited a somewhat lesser position to the most well-known names in the Breitling range, although in hindsight, it was still a delightful chronograph. Today the prices for these watches vary, and have risen in the case of the most exciting versions, although these remain some of the overall best preserved vintage watches out there. Nonetheless, you can still get a lot for your money if you choose the silver dialed versions, such as the more affordable Reference 2002 with a 35mm case, or if you want to spend a bit more, the Reference 815 with a 38mm case, tricompact dial layout, and sometimes panda dial. This really would be a great choice if you can find one. These feature manually wound vegetal movements, such as the Velger 7736, which can be serviced fairly easily, and should give years of use. Prices for these vary between about £1,500 and well over £3,000 for the rarer versions. Ultimately, whichever watch you choose, you'll get a little bit of the Bond scene to enjoy, whether it's the warmth of a tropical island in the 1960s, or the cold of Soviet Russia. Which is your favourite? If you enjoyed this video, remember to like, share and subscribe, it really helps to keep these videos coming. Thank you very much for watching. This is Armon from watchchronicle.com. Out.